Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the second last talk on Pythagoras stage done by Phil Nash and it will be on how to create a perfect prototype. Please enjoy the presentation and give him a warm welcome everyone. Hi there. Am I on? Can you hear me? I can't hear myself, so there we are. That's cool. Hi, uh, I'm Phil. Uh, I am a web developer. Uh, I work at a company called Mint Digital. Um, we are a, an agency, uh, but we've also uh, delved into um, creating uh, our own products as well. So we have a lot of time where we're, we, we spend trying to build out new services uh, kind of quickly uh, and prototype them as best we can in order to uh, make up new stuff for ourselves. And what I want to talk to you about today is that prototyping thing. Uh, but first, I, I should probably define what I mean by a prototype. Um, as I said, I'm a web developer, so we're kind of talking about web applications here. Um, uh, we also, at Mint, work with, uh, with Ruby on Rails. Um, so that is kind of our general stack, is, is you know, HTML, JavaScript, Ruby on Rails, uh, uh, web applications. Uh, we have built other things in the past, um, iOS applications, for example. Uh, but my uh, biggest um, kind of experience uh, is within uh, web applications. So a prototype for me is uh, a web application that you can use to test out uh, a kind of hypothesis that you have about a particular product before you build out the real product and go ahead and launch it. Um, and prototyping is hard. Uh, we've done it, I, I've been at Mint for around five and a half years and We've done many, many prototypes, and they've, uh, some of them have been kind of our, our, some of our least satisfying uh, projects um, because it's hard. It's, not, um, it's, it's just not the most obvious thing to do, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, firstly, I just want to tell you what we're going to kind of cover. Um, firstly, why they're hard, uh, and, and I just want to come across you know, a few of the issues that we've had in building prototypes in our time. Uh, we're then going to talk about how we came to a solution, and hopefully it's a solution that other people can kind of follow and use and see yourselves. Uh, and finally, because we're developers, uh, how to work on that code to build that pro perfect prototype. Um, cool. So problems with prototype. We've kind of figured out that there's been three issues with the kind of prototypes that we've been developing uh, at Mint, uh, whether it's for ourselves or for our clients as well. Uh, and those, product, uh, those problems uh, is, is that it can slip, uh, it can bloat, uh, or is there's just a lack of focus. And um, what I mean by that is, uh, with a prototype, you don't tend to have uh, a deadline. Um, it's kind of, a, we're going to create this thing and, and find out uh, you know, whether it works, but there's no hard launch date. It's just a prototype, it's there for testing. Um, and so that can lead to hard decisions getting put off, and maybe the thing never being created at all. Um, or never being finished, anyway. And that's, that is a massive failure, of course. Um, I never thought I'd say this out loud, let alone to kind of a group of people. But deadlines are great. Um, they get, great. And clicker. Um, they, get, they get stuff done, because you have to get stuff done. Uh, a deadline is great. I'll come back to that uh, in, in just a minute. Uh, we also have the issues of bloat. When we don't have this deadline, and when we are trying to make a, a, a prototype of a product that we think maybe maybe will change the world, uh, you probably you, you know you don't feel held back uh, by the fact that um, uh, that you are just building a prototype. So you can, you, you can tend to end up piling extra bits on uh, before up until the point where you have. Uh, a very bloated prototype that's not really testing anything at all. It's not testing that first thing that you thought of, that first thing that you wanted to do, or that your client wanted to do. Uh, and there can be a lack of focus. Again, with the fact that we don't have uh, a prototype, uh, sorry, we have a prototype that we want to create, um, but it's not, it's not launching a product. It's, um, it, it, it never kind of becomes priority number one. There's always other things to do, and maybe yourself as a developer, uh, or even the client, isn't spending 100% of their attention on building that, uh, that, that, that prototype, and therefore it can just lack focus, it can wander around, and, um, and just never get anywhere in the end. So those are uh, our problems, uh, I feel, with prototypes, and, and prototyping in general. 
uh, particularly in, this, in my web app world. Um, so we need to find a solution to this. Uh, and uh, I'm kind of in a lucky position in that we didn't have to, uh, at Mint, kind of, we didn't have to dig around and try and work out how to make a solution for this. Because it kind of happened uh, naturally out of our uh, company culture, which was quite lucky, uh, I'll be honest. But uh, I want to, uh, I, w I want to show you kind of how that happened um, and how the solution kind of found us. Um, so I think this is a picture. This is a, a lovely picture of Mint Digital in uh, 2008. March 2008. I'm not in the picture, sadly. I was uh, heading out a, um, my n notice period at my last uh, company. Uh, but this is Mint Digital at the Web App Weekender in 2008. And our Web App Weekender, um, uh, I, had, I had fun looking into the history of this, actually, and going back and seeing some old blog posts from the, uh, the head of my company uh, back from 2007, 2008. Uh, but in 2007, he announced that we were going to go away in November of 2007 and compete with some other agencies on building on basically a hack week and, and who could build the best hack in that week. Uh, that never happened and eventually got pushed back to March 2008 where we went away and we split into three different teams out of our company and we built web applications and competed against ourselves. Uh, and this kind of has then happened every year since in which we've uh, we got away we get a brief for that application, and, um, and we spend a week hacking, um, sometimes going to the pub, because you know, it's, a, it's a week away that we've got together with ourselves, and it's, um, it's nice to go to the pub. We tend to go to the, uh, uh, the southwest of England. We fly our New York office over. We all go out to the southwest of England, and, uh, and we go to a tiny village or a hotel, and we take over the place. And this is pretty much the only other entertainment there is in the entire vicinity. So you go to the pub. Occasionally, there are dressing gowns or other gifts involved. Um, this uh, was my first Web Weekender and was quite a surprise when we all got dressing gowns. Very weird. But mainly hacking. Uh, that's the important thing. And these are other guys at Mint uh, working away. This is from two years ago, um, where they tried to build a product for, where they sold paper flowers by swearing at people. I'll get to that later. <laughs> um, so it's a hack week. and. Um, even like the, the, there's loads of hack weeks, there's loads of hack days and things going on. Actually, this event has been has had a bit of a hack week going on, hasn't it? There's 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 competitions, all that kind of thing. Um, any of you guys take part in the hack day, hack week, whatever it was? No. Yeah, okay. Um, also, like um, last July, sorry, July just gone. Over there in the Indigo too, there was hacked, which was a, a 500 person, 24 hour hack day. Is anybody at that at all? Hacked. No, it was great fun, 24 hours. I ended up sleeping on the floor of the uh, Indigo 2 where you know, countless people have stood and watched bands and things like that. It was a really awkward and uncomfortable floor. But that was a hack day. Um, and I think yeah, like, if you've been on a hack day, you know that at the end of uh, uh, a hack, however much effort, however little sleep you've had, what are all the time you've put into it, um, you're proud of the thing that you came up with at the end. And I tell you what, it doesn't bloat or anything like that either, does it? You don't have the time for that. So um, in the Mint Hack Week, uh, we've built a number of different things. So from 2008, we built a project called Snapper, which, um, which was a way to make you, uh, allow you to create your own photo competitions. Uh, this was in early 2008, so it was kind of just on the cusp of smartphones being cool. So we may be a little bit early there. Um, the year after, we built What the Tweet, which was a real-time game where you had to guess a removed word from a celebrity's tweet. And when you won, you got to mess with the other players' screens, which was a lot of fun. Uh, Rafiki was our first go at iOS development on a Web at Weekender. So... Um, the, uh, the company went away, and we actually hadn't built iOS apps at all before then. And so we not only had to learn iOS, I, iOS app development, but do it in four days and, uh, and present at the end. Rafiki was basically a, um, uh, it was a footballer uh, and a Tamagotchi. So you had to train the guy and feed him and make him play higher and higher versions of football. Um, and it was, it was great fun, and it was our first iOS app. Um, two years ago... Two years ago, 
uh, we made a thing called Debatables, which was a way of proving your point using other people's quotations based on a website that we had running at the time called Quotables. Now, the problem, of, the problem with those things was they were all just products of our hack week. Um, and none of them ever amounted to anything, really, um, because they were just for the competition. They were not really, they hadn't got a future to them. But we did get serious, uh, because around two years ago, we also uh, launched our first product, which did well, um, which is a site called Stickygram, which allowed you, allows you to create, take your Instagrams and turn them into fridge magnets. Simple idea, but uh, it was a product that worked. And um, so for the year after that, we wanted to uh, take what we'd learned from actually launching a product and build our own product. And from that, uh, in four days, Foldable Me was born. And this is uh, still an ongoing product for us, where you can uh, take your, um, you can kind of make like a Nintendo Me, uh, and then we turn it into a little cardboard guy that you can fold up and create into yourself. I even managed to get myself on the homepage of this. That's my chin. Um, <laughs> And we built that in four days, or the first version of it in four days. What actually took the most time is um, getting together enough mouths, lips, noses, and uh, hair to make people look different. Um, but we built that in four days. So are hack days just the answer, or hack weeks in our case, uh, to building prototypes? Well, no, and for a couple of reasons. Um, we built that site, or there's code in the site that we built in that week. Uh, that was a terrible idea. I'll tell you why about that later. But hack weeks are not, not just the answer. There's more to it. Uh, so when we were dealing with Foldable Me, we also kind of had the idea that, um, you know, we still have an agency business to run. And we deal with, we like to deal with brands and, uh, and, and, and big companies like that to build sites for them. Um, but, for advertising, we've discovered uh, they still think digital's the next big thing. As developers, it's already been and gone. It's the big thing. It's all the next big things. We know this. But advertising agencies kind of uh, are still dealing with you know, print and TV and all those kinds of things as well. So we wanted to uh, provide a scheme in which we could immerse uh, advertising professionals into the world of uh, digital. Um, and so we started taking... Uh, as part of a training scheme, advertising professionals uh, a way to do a similar Web Up Weekender. Four days, a team of developers and designers from Mint and teams of people from the advertising company come together, fulfill a brief, and create a, an application in four days and, um, a, as a training scheme. And what we ended up with these, uh, and we did it twice, uh, with four teams, uh, two teams each time, and each time we ended up with very tightly focused prototypes um, uh, an all-round team agreement and a very clear proposition of what we had at the end of it. We had a much better prototype application at the end of uh, a, a week away with uh, a bunch of guys in advertising um, than, uh, than we'd ever actually uh, created ourselves on our, uh, on our Web App Weekenders, where we'd gone for kind of fully featured show off what we can do. Uh, this became tightly focused, and it showed us that the... Uh, that this was much better. So I scared myself with my own slide there. Um, so we thought we'd try it with a client. Uh, another client, uh, uh, you know, who has an idea, needs to test something because we're not sure whether it's going to work. And so we'll take it on with the client. And what it gave us was a deadline with that, with that client, a tight set of features uh, to, uh, to build, uh, and an incredible focus because we had um, uh, developers, designers, and, and people behind the project who, who'd come up with the research and the, the stuff in the first place, uh, they're in the same room making decisions and answering questions all, all within that four days. So if we look back at the problems with our prototypes, um, when you've got four days, you can't slip. When you've got four days, you can't blow it up. And when you've got everybody there in the same room with you at the same time, uh, you, there is only focus. Uh, so that is kind of how we think um, prototypes work, uh, or prototypes should be built. Um, it's, it's genuinely about getting uh, the people making decisions and the people building the product there together. Uh, and 
in a short space of time so that you don't go on and on and on. And so the proto perfect prototype, in my opinion, requires a small dedicated team uh, with fast decision making and a clear proposition that you focus on throughout the entire uh, uh, process. And that way, at the end of the day, you will have an application that is ready to, ready to take to people to test to see what they do with it. Um, and ready to take to other stakeholders in the business as well, if that's the case. Um, oh, yes, testable application. There we go. Um, so, excuse me a second. Uh, and, and yeah, the, the absolute key to it at the end of it is, of course, the testing. Um, if you're watching uh, Nolan Bushnell's talk earlier, he um, at one point had a slide up with, uh, with the kind of uh, idea... Uh, uh, it, was, it, was, it was talking about um, taking those ideas and making them real and, uh, and, and the cycle of idea uh, production and, and learning and then iterating on that and going round and round. And this is just that first step. This gives us that product to test and iterate on. And it gives it to us very quickly as well. So let's talk about coding that perfect prototype because once we've got everybody in the same room, we then need to actually go and build it. Uh, and as I've said before, oh, sorry, <laughs> you can't code a perfect pres uh, prototype, uh, especially in four days. It's, but then, of course, no software is ever perfect. What we need to do is, is just be able to code what we need there and then to test our proposition. So we're, always, we're about coding the best prototype you can in a very short space of time. And I think there's a, there's a number of ways that you, uh, you can help yourself uh, in order to build a very quick hack uh, that's going to work and going to help you test. Um, so as I said earlier, what I do is, is Ruby on Rails and JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. That's what I do. Um, uh, five years ago when I started at Mint, um, the order of that would probably have been reversed because I was brought in as a front-end coder. And, uh, and I've learned all the rails and, and all the other techniques along the way. So frameworks are the first thing we start out. Obviously, nobody is going out, or nobody should be going out and, uh, and writing a server in order to write a website. So you need to use everything available to you to get a head start. And I have rails. Um, obviously, uh, other uh, languages will have other frameworks, but this is, this is where I live. So I have Rails. But also on top of Rails, we also have things like Devise, which give you um, uh, user management out the box. You don't have to bother about uh, writing how to manage users, how to log in, anything like that. No need to. Get something to do it for you. Similarly, we have Active Admin or Rails Admin, uh, which are both ways of giving you an automated and generated administration uh, uh, thing, so that um, you don't have to worry about just looking at your data in the back end. That can be given to you as well. Um, on the front end, jQuery, I don't care if you only write one other line of JavaScript for your entire application. Um, if jQuery is going to make it easier, get it in there. It's only a prototype. Use everything, absolutely everything you can. Uh, if you don't have a designer, um, and if you hate HTML, because uh, I, well, I dislike Bootstrap, but I put it on there because if you need to, if, if it's just maybe a couple of developers doing an application and you maybe have no design ability, because I know I don't, uh, then something like Bootstrap will help you along the way to stop thinking about uh, the bits of the application that you don't need to think about, um, such as design if you're a developer. Um, so you need to use everything you have available to you to get a head start. If there are, um, uh, yeah, I'll come to other bits in a minute. Templates. So what's nice uh, about things like Rails and, and uh, well, Bootstrap kind of counts in this case as well, is that you should actually use everything that your framework gives you to actually do even more stuff before you start that application. This is before we've even started coding. Um, there are certain things you always need, like that user management, like that admin system. So you don't even need to think about putting them in. You shouldn't need to think about putting them in on day one of your hack. You should start before that. So in Rails, and this is, uh, I'm afraid, the only kind of line of code I have in the entire um, presentation, but that last presentation seemed fairly intense, so uh, hopefully this is a, uh, a bit of a let-off. Um, when you start a new Rails application, that's what you'd normally do. But what you can do 
is hand it a Ruby script to, uh, to create a template for you. And this actually, um, oh, that's example.com. But I know uh, there's another agency, uh, Friends with Mint, made by many, who have uh, recently released uh, their template that they use, uh, what they called uh, Allele. And um, it gives you all of the things that uh, I think I, uh, I kind of went through. I think it also gives you kind of a blog out of the box as well, because you should never think about writing a blog. Of course, if you're not writing a blog, then don't worry about it, or use Tumblr. But it gives you all those kind of uh, things. Um, and you, you've, you, all you've run is that line of code, and suddenly pff, you've got most of an application. The important thing, uh, sorry, at Mint, we don't have a template like that. Uh, what we have is a Rails project that we've built up over time that we keep up to date, and we can just copy and put into place and get straight on with it. Again, it gives us our users. It gives us our admin, admin area. Uh, it sets our databases up properly. It gets us ready to deploy it as well. It gives us all of those things without us having to think about it whilst trying to hack. And it allows us to just simply concentrate on the problem that is at hand. There is a, a, an application that needs to be built, not user administration, not all other kinds of admin. There is, there is an application which, your, which, which the team that you have in that room, which the decision makers on the client side, or whoever it is, want to make. So we just get to concentrate on that domain problem. Testing. Uh, who's been to a hack day and tested their application? written tests for it whilst writing a hack. Nice. <laughs> um, God, I don't know. 24 hours. If I've got 24 hours, I'm not going to write tests. But when I've got four days, which is, which is nice about this, this whole idea, that when I've got four days to do it in, testing is absolutely important. Test all the time. Um, we are, uh, we are lucky in the Ruby community that testing is a, uh, a, a thing that is, is beaten into us almost by uh, other people in the community. Uh, and I'm now guilty of that. I've got the slide up. I've seen this in, in multiple other conferences. It's all the fucking time. Um, because, uh, because it matters. Um, it matters because, uh, you know, if you do write code and write tests, they are your insurance policy and you know this. But when you're in four days, when you've got to launch and you've got to present something at the end of four days, uh, then you need to know if you broke something in the middle of that because you don't have time to fix it or you don't have time to fix it when you find out later that you've broken it. You need to be confident that when you put even hastily written code in front of a user that it is going to work. Just about. Deploying. Again, we're talking about a prototype application that people that we're going to put in front of real users, real people. And in order to do that, we can't just have it sitting on our, on our own laptops. Works on my machine is not going to cut it in, uh, in this particular case. So we need, to, uh, we need to deploy. And I think you need to deploy as often just to show progress to the rest of your team as well. They're in, there, in that room with you thinking about, uh, you know, all the important questions, but they also need to know where we are in the process. So deploying all the time uh, shows the progress. We're a great fan of the ship at Squirrel at Mint uh, in our um, in our day-to-day -day projects as well as uh, as well as when hacking, um, because getting it out there is what matters, and that will show you whether you've written something wrong and that does break and that you do need to fix, even if you've tested for it. Um, but it also keeps everybody else up to date. And it means that you're not uh, trying to load in features that are far too big uh, that may just collapse other parts of it as well. Um, as you, can, you know, uh, my colleague uh, Adam Rogers has given a talk recently on deploying all the king time, daft instead of taft. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and there is whole other kind of ideas about um, continuous deployment that are important to think about. But in the terms of a hack, deploying all of the all the time is also important. Uh, so you should d definitely start shipping it from day one. I mean, obviously only to your team rather than to the public. We're not launching a product here. Um, you're going to make it easy to ship and be aware of the limitations of your server. So, with, um, so to make it easy for me to ship things during a hack like this, uh, I will do it to Heroku. That is the absolute easiest way I can deploy something uh, easily and quickly uh, when, when I've got a Rails project. Um, there's a recent startup, I think, called Jumpstarter, who are 
sound like they're doing the same for PHP. I'm not quite sure, but that's uh, it's quite a good thing. And, and Heroku covers Java and other languages as well. Python, I think, maybe. Um, but the, the the limitations are important. In the, the first time I uh, first time I did one of these hacks with a client, um, I forgot about Heroku's ephemeral file system. So every time we deployed any photos I'd uploaded, all got wiped away, and it was just a terrible, terrible day. <laughs> Having to deploy as we were getting closer to present, deploying, re-uploading, deploying, re-uploading. So make it easy, but also know what those limitations are because it can turn and bite you in the ass. It's rather not a sprint. It's, it's four days, not 24 hours. Um, when we do a hack week uh, in order to make a prototype, it's not a 24-hour hack. You don't have to sleep for an hour on the floor of a gig venue. Um, it's important to, uh, to, to, to get sleep uh, and, and write decent code, write good code, not just keep piling it on top of each other. Um, I feel like when we used to do, uh, oh, oh, sorry, when we do our weekends away uh, with Mint, uh, we do tend to stay up late, uh, but that probably has more to do with the pub than the hacking at the time. Uh, so, uh, but you, you don't have to burn out on this. Uh, sometimes it's required to do a few extra hours um, on, a, on a hack week, but it shouldn't have to be uh, sprinting all the time just to get all the way through it. Um, what else we got? And at the end of it, throw it all away. Not before you test it. That would be a bad idea. Um, but like I said uh, earlier, with Foldable Me, uh, that project still has code that we wrote in four days uh, running an awful lot of the project. And it has caused an awful lot of pain. You will... Uh, it's, it's never going to be your best code when you write it really quickly. Uh, you will make bad decisions. I definitely make a load of bad decisions when doing that. And so launching a prototype as a full service is just going to, it's going to kill you. Um, all those bad decisions you will just be kicking yourself for, for months and months and months. Um, so the prototype is for testing, putting it in front of people, and iterating on. But if you come to actually launch a real project, Throw it all away and start again, and don't do it in four days. So, in order to code uh, the best prototype you can in a very short space of time, um, use those frameworks as best you can. Um, template them up, get everything out of the way first. Test it, because you'll want that. Um, ship it, go to bed, and then once that's all done, iterate on that prototype. Um, I skipped over a bit earlier, so I'm just going to head back to it and just tell you a couple of bits about the prototypes we've made with clients uh, that have kind of followed all of this and have caused problems. So our first one, uh, the one I had the problems with the images, was for uh, V Inspired, who are a, uh, a charity that uh, uh, try to get children into um, volunteering. And uh, the, product, the prototype we tried to make was, a, was an application to gamify volunteering uh, for children of the age of 12 and 13. Uh, definitely something that needed testing, because none of us in that room were 12 or 13, and none of us knew how children were going to react like that. So we needed to produce a way that uh, would encourage them to get on with, uh, uh, with, uh, with volunteering uh, uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, to actually encourage them to start this volunteering and then they become volunteers for the rest of the time at V-Inspired. Um, I think we, we got our prototype out the door and we tested it in front of users and it has actually required a lot of iteration because we were wrong to start with. And I think that's fine. We can be wrong. We just have to keep going back at it. You know what the idea is? It's just the nuances of how to get it right for that audience. And that's why prototyping it and doing it quickly uh, really uh, helped us out. And we've also managed to do uh, uh, we've also managed to do this for Tesco recently in a prototype to um, help users kind of delve into the data that Tesco has on them uh, and prototype ways that that makes it not look incredibly intrusive because we all know that they have a lot of data about them. We just about us. We just don't think about it much. Um, so again, testing that idea of, of getting the data to the users, into the users' hands without them worrying too much about it 
is, is, is what we're testing and what our prototype was about. And uh, again, like the, the results over those four days, what the, um, our proposition was, uh, was, was very tight by the end of it. And now it is requiring testing and it's going out in front of users, I think, soon. Um, small amounts of users. So in order to create the perfect prototype, um, focus is the most uh, important thing. Deadlines will give you that focus. And deadlines are great. Um, if you have all the decision makers in the room at the same time, or at least the majority ones, the important people making decisions, then um, questions cannot get away from you. Um, you're not going to put things off because everybody is there and can, can discuss it and make the right decision for that time. Do as little code as you can. That's, that's basically what I'm saying with, the, uh, with that kind of head start thing. Use all those templates, use all the frameworks, write as little as you possibly can. Um, even though big numbers do look good, I, uh, I just looked up uh, the number of lines of code I pushed into the application for V-Inspired. And I think it ran to just under 13,000 within four days. And I think that included um, putting in the original application but uh, with, with all the frameworks and templates. So I hope I didn't write all of those 13,000. I hope I wrote like 2,000. And the rest of it was all kind of stuff we'd done beforehand. Um, and then finally, ship it. Get it out onto the web so that you can show real users and take it to them. And, and we can't just keep it on our laptops. Um, I think I absolutely kept talking incredibly quickly there, and I've gone uh, quite a way through quite quickly, very quickly. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> what this means is we have a lot of time for questions. <laughs> Has anybody, uh, anybody got a question? I think we need to wait for a microphone, or there's, there's one over there. So if anybody does have any questions, um, please do. Uh, raise a hand, shout out. If we don't have any questions, I'm going to finish really early. There we go. <laughs> Hi. Hey. Uh, I want to ask you how are you, or if you are testing usability of your users, mm. of users of your products? And how are oh, you doing, how are we doing that? Yes. Oh, I see. What methodology are you using or what methods? Um, I can't uh, answer f uh, fully on that um, because they tend to let the designers go out and test the usability for some reason uh, and keep the developers, um, keep the developers back, in, uh, back in the office. Um, but I do know that uh, with, the, with the applications that we've done, that it's been very important to um, like go to real users, real potential users, sit with them, watch them use the application. Uh, this is particularly important with the, uh, uh, with the children's one uh, because it, it, there's so little known about how people, kids of the age of 12 and 13 really do use the internet. Um, a lot of it uh, can be, because um, they're in a very transitional period at that point where they're moving from using the internet with their parents to using it on their own. So we, 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 we sat with them, uh, we let them use it, we asked them questions, uh, but it was about a lot about the observation and knowing what happened and, uh, and why. And I think um, what, what it turned out with our uh, uh, thing that was um, the way we gamified it just wasn't correct. Uh, and it was, it was anti kind of getting them to get their friends involved, which is exactly what we wanted, uh, to get more people involved and they kind of went out on their own. Uh, so um, that's, uh, so yeah, I'm afraid I don't know about the methodologies as such, but, but uh, more than observation. Uh, Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, when you're in a situation where you've created something for a client, they've set you a brief, you've gone, you've created something, yep. it doesn't work, um, and so you end up creating something else. Um, with that original idea, who does that sit with? So if you essentially, if you created like a creative solution to something mm. that they gave you and that solution wasn't the one and you end up creating another solution, in terms, have you, have you ever been in, in a situation where maybe the old solution was the solution to somebody else's problem and can you use it because it was with somebody else or? Um, that's, uh, that's, an, that's an interesting point. I mean, 
in, in, in terms of this the kind of methodology, the way we go through this, you don't you don't make something that they didn't want okay. uh, because they're there at the same time and they see it coming through and it's, it's actually a, a, a fantastic, it's, I, I was going to say side effect, it's not a side effect, it's the real effect of building an application with the people that care about it there at the same time and seeing what happens. Um, now in the case of kind of the problems that I described with prototypes where you can end up building the wrong thing and uh, because communication's gone awry or something like that then um, uh, it, I, I can't think of a, a, an occasion where we have had it such that um, we built something that can be used somewhere else but we're always open to that you know um, development is not about doing the same thing twice really is it um, and, uh, and yeah uh, we uh, I believe within our contracts we retain the right to an, any of the code that we wrote so um, I think that that is probably important in in a lot of code that you write don't just hand it away and not be able to use it ever again because don't repeat yourself <laughs> um, if you're going on a hack week with a client yes um, he is he with you uh, in the same room with you the whole time well, because I uh, when, when I say the whole time, I kind of mean, you know, when you go to bed, you kind of probably do that on your own. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, with a wrong client, or it could be very stressful if he's... Uh uh, that's absolutely true. That absolutely could be the case. Um, we have, I, I believe, well, I, I, I don't want to say we've been lucky with that in what we've done, because um, I think we're just as much into picking our clients that we want to do this with as, as they are picking us that they want to work with us on this as well. Um, secondly, the fact that they're so involved in the process of building what they want, um, it, it kind of takes a lot of the ego or anything like that that could cause problems out of it because we're all there and we've all got a deadline and we've all got to just get it done. So um, maybe that's been a, a, a way that that's actually kept that away, kept that out of it. Because I suppose, like, in initial meetings, you can't tell if you're, you're going to hate being in that room with that person all that time. But um, I, I think the process kind of helps it, in, in a way. Anybody else? Uh, in that case, have I... Uh, uh, gone really slow, uh, really early. Um, please do come and talk to me uh, anytime afterwards if you've got any other questions that you don't want to, to raise your hand about. Um, and, uh, you know, go out and hack. Uh, <laughs> go out and hack with people, with other people, and get um, uh, make those prototypes and make them as best, uh, uh, best as you can by just keeping it tight, focused, concentrated, and uh, all together. No, we have a question. Yes. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, we've used uh, templates and frameworks. Uh, do you use one set, and are all your developers in agreement that that's the set that you should use? And how do you deal with moving over to new frameworks and templates? Um, that's interesting. We're actually in a period at the moment of updating. Like I say, uh, our we don't we don't use the Rails templates like I showed. Um, we actually have a, a, like a pre-built, ready-to-go application to then start building on top of. Uh, and that's been built up over the years of, um, of, of building projects at Mint. Uh, we also have a, a number of gems, uh, a number of libraries similar to the ones I discussed, like Devise, and well, we use Devise, but we don't use Active Admin or Rails Admin because we have our own one of those as well. And so that is all very much built up to what we expect and what we like to work with. Um, moving over to, to new things, I mean, we... Uh, we're currently in a situation where half of our projects are JavaScript and half of them are CoffeeScript. Um, and I like CoffeeScript and I only want to keep going on CoffeeScript because I think that makes it easier to write things and quicker to write things than, than having to mess about with some of the intricacies of JavaScript that it, it papers over. And some people don't like writing CoffeeScript. <laughs> so we, we are in a position where we, we now have projects in each. And when it comes to... Um, if it comes to a, a, a hack day, hack week like that, um, you kind of have to take the, uh, the little team that you have at the time. And we tend to do these things with kind of two developers, maybe three, and a, and a designer. So it's only a small team that you have to discuss what you do and don't want to include. Uh, and you can, uh, 
that's, that's pretty easy to get over. Um, I can say we're actually upgrading our current uh, template um, because, uh, firstly, to get up to date with Rails 4, which is fairly new. Um, but we also have a whole bunch of ideas that we've just not had the time to fix in, uh, in, in recent times, has been busy with client work and our own products. So it's now we've got to a point where we, can, where we are making those decisions. And there's, uh, there's quite an email list going on about that at the moment. But uh, it, I think it all does come down to the fact that we have shared experiences of a number of uh, application builds, both quickly and uh, traditionally, um, that we tend to know what, uh, what we do actually like. And if, if we don't, then um, we can have some good, uh, good long debates about it. But there does tend to eventually be an answer. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, you mentioned one special template in your talk uh, that you recommend. Uh, Allele, um, the one from Made by Many. I've not used it myself. Um, uh, it's on their GitHub. I, I think it's uh, github.com slash made by many slash Allele, A double L E L E. It looks pretty good. It does include a lot of the things that. I would uh, that, that sound um, sound like they would be very useful, and it's actually what they're using to do rapid prototyping for things with as well. So they have theirs published. We just don't have anything like that published at the moment. So um, uh, I'd like to recommend it because I know that they're all they're good guys, they're good developers. I've not used it myself before. And uh, are you using this techni technique uh, <laughs> with all your customers or? Um are you still doing some traditional prototyping? Well, I mean, eventually we have to go and build a full, or we will eventually build a full project, which takes an awful lot longer, of course. And like I said, you've got to throw those prototypes away because they're just a terrible mess of code by the time you end up at the end of it. Uh, or they can be. They can be very good. Um, so, yeah, we do still do full site builds, full application builds that, um, excuse me, uh, that require a lot more time and effort um, we've not, the way we're, we're kind of selling it to people, it, it, if somebody has a problem that they don't know how to find a solution to, it, it's almost um, a bit too cocky to kind of walk into a, a pitch with them and say, we know what the solution to your problem is. Um, so we're kind of going in and saying, what we can do is find that solution together, test it, which will save you a whole load of money if you're wrong. and then. And then we can decide whether we, you know, how to build it, where to build it, and uh, and the full feature set and everything like that. So um, it depends. If if a client knows exactly what they want to build and they just want to a full application build, then we're perfectly happy to go with that. But it's it's for the time when you need to prototype, and you need to test, and you need to uh, work out whether your assumptions are uh, correct or not, or whether they can be changed slightly, altered, iterated on, and then finally correct that. Um, that we, we want to that we offer this kind of thing, uh, and I think it's um, you know it's the the kind of thing we're thinking about for for everybody really. We don't know the solutions to those people's problems unless it's something that directly affects us and we have a solution for, and that's very rare. Um, so obviously, in the long term, it's something that benefits you and your company, but in the kind of short term, when you're proposing the idea to clients, mm. do you generally get the feeling that they kind of warm up to it and they like the idea, or that they're generally quite reluctant and it takes a bit of winning to the get idea them to understand? Of a rapid prototyping. Yeah, so actually, to take somebody from their company off with you yeah, for yeah. the weekend and all the rest. Um, of it. They. Yeah, they do have to watch it because it's not something that gets um, proposed that often. People come in and propose solutions. Yeah. Um, and, and clients, I think, want to hear solutions. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it, I was surprised the first time we did it. I was in the pitch for the first time we did this. And I kind of walked out of that and going, did we really just say we don't know what we're doing? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, they, they, they do certainly warm to it. And, and the process uh, and the... The fact that at the end, at a, in, in a very short space of time from um, deciding to go with us and, and build this, it's, um, you know, they have something in their hands which they can use. And when they see that that, that time scale is cut right to there to, to be able to test it rather than a kind of six month build or something like that, mm. that uh, that's the sort of thing that, that excites them. Um, and I think that, that excites, uh, excites us as well. 
because um, actually, frankly, I, I I want to talk about this because I like I I like doing these hacks. Like hack days are great fun, and, and hack week is brilliant. And and there's just a there's a wonderful sense of um, teamwork and uh, everything in the room when you're when you are working on that. That um, that just kind of a normal uh, web app build doesn't doesn't have the same. So. Uh, Yes, especially once they actually uh, experience it, it's uh, they get we get quite good feedback for that as well. And but like anybody who's been to a hack day knows how much fun that kind of thing is, so it's getting them involved as well. And well, that was what I was going to say next. Is is there a kind of standard procedure that you have for the very very beginning of the hack weekend? Uh, with the client? Yeah. So again, it's in, I'm kind of thinking in terms of mixing the fact that the client has no. <coughs> isn't in that arena at all and now they're going to be fully immersed into it mm. uh, that's a good point um, we haven't actually done that before no um, I suppose uh, that original that early start on it we're dealing with the, the members of that that company who have um, they they have researched and de dealt with the, you know their problem already so that they're, they're they're already kind of the experts in the room in the domain that we're about to work in okay. we're the experts in the room in how to build it and um, and uh, well, I, I suppose like we don't start writing, or the development team probably don't start writing code on the first minute, as we do kind of talk through the idea, everybody's feelings and, and thoughts on it. Not feelings. It's not. <laughs> it's yeah. not that emotional. Um, uh, you talk through everybody's thoughts on it, and 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 then you have a direction in which to go, and. Uh, uh, and then it helps that if, if, if somebody then drives kind of discussion of what we actually need to make uh, decisions on, because there are still things we need to start setting up. We'll start working on the design and start start styling the front of the thing um, before we actually kind of have to put any data in place, because um, you don't necessarily know what that is yet. Um, and not wasting time and not wasting code is uh, is obviously massively important in uh, in that in that short space of time. So going off and building something that nobody wanted is just not going to help anybody. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's about getting together and, and heading off in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, there's not no no such process, but just a it's clarification at the could, start. Could talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hey, Hi. you mentioned that for one time you split in three teams and then worked on the on an idea or a prototype this um, is what yeah oh sorry what's your question <laughs> <laughs> sorry um you think it's good to share in between or just to wait until the end and oh everybody okay stays so on the that's kind of why i interrupted um so when we do it in three teams this is where we go away as a company on our own this is our um oh. this is actually when we're away uh, on our own all the way back here where we might it's a long way back, isn't it? When we're hacking like that, but when we're also wearing dressing gowns and when we're in the pub, uh, that's, this is the kind of thing. And actually, what we get at that point is um, we get the same brief. It's a weird one to keep up. We get the same brief, but we actually all tend to come at it at very different angles. So the kind of apps that I did describe uh, that we'd done, um, those were all, well, the, the, the bottom three were all the kind of my team uh, that I, uh, I took a part on, but there were two other applications that were completely different. So the actual, um, the briefs in this case were, uh, the first one was just build a web application, any web application you want. Um, the second one was build a real-time game. Uh, and the, oh, no, sorry, real-time application, didn't have to be a game, because uh, the other two teams built, one was a real-time uh, rhythm-based game on the internet, um, which went along to a bizarre YouTube aerobics video. Um, and uh, the third team built uh, kind of a real-time jukebox uh, online. This was all in Flash as well. Um, again, with the, uh, the Rafiki, the football one, the, our, our, our brief was to create an iOS app um, and something to do with the Football World Cup, which was upcoming that summer. Um, and so the other teams had built... One was a drinking game based on... Um, uh, uh, things that happened in the game, uh, and the other one was um, was just kind of a visualizer of the data of the game as it as it happened. Uh, and then in um, Debatables, that was where we were trying to actually promote our quote site. So that's why uh, one of the teams started making Valentine's cards. We were in February, and it's before Valentine's Day. And they were making Valentine's cards out of quotations, and they were sat up all night um, 
like making uh, cards in Illustrator from things that people had ordered, which is nuts and a lot of work, but they did quite well out of it. Um, so that kind of thing, that's, that is our, our fun hack week, and actually we like to keep a lot of secrecy uh, then. Uh, we don't want to display our ideas until uh, we get to the end, but that's all part of our, our kind of fun. Uh, that's, that's honed our ability to do these things quickly. In fact, sorry, uh, the, um, the third team, not making Valentine's cards and not us, they made three different projects in the one week, so they really, they really kept us guessing because they had three different things and one included a balloon launch on a beach. So um, <laughs> that's, we don't share those ideas because we're trying to win. Um, when, uh, um, when we did it with the advertising company as a training exercise, again, it was kind of a, the competition was part of the exercise and that helped us, uh, again, kept it secret, present at the end. It's quite nice. Whether it's, whether it's with a client, there's one, uh, one team and we present to the rest of the company and anybody else at the client's company uh, at the end of the week to show them where we've come, where we've got to. Uh, um, and we also have the ability if we're uh, uh, to, to draft in extra people if we are running out of time. <laughs> uh, okay, well thank you very much for your questions and for listening to me. Um, uh, enjoy the last couple of talks. All right, everyone, I would just like to say thank you for listening to this presentation. And please do stay and uh, stay if you're interested in developing because there will be a, a report given by Matos Kapitanakis on developer trends. So if you're interested, you should actually stay. It will be very good for you. Thank you very much.